Thanks, uh, Ashley, and thanks, Kieran, for leaving me to follow that. Um, I'd like to introduce this roundtable. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Rice, and I'm moderating this roundtable on handling fear, uncertainty, and doubt in any innovative or evolving audiovisual preservation practice. In a few minutes, I'll invite our panelists to introduce themselves. But first, I wanted to share a bit about this topic from personal experience. Uh, one of the complex dynamics of the preservation community is this balance between consensus and innovation. On one hand, it's important to collaborate as a community to bring together voices, uh, to dismantle gatekeeping, and develop our own best practices from which we can all use as a foundation to build upon. On the other hand, we continuously find ways to improve upon or challenge our best practices, discover flaws in our approaches, or uncover opportunities to innovate for something new or do better. After school in my first archival job, I was writing an audio preservation plan and my colleagues suggested using the FLAC audio format as a file format to consider, consider for preservation. I said uh, that we'd be using the, uh, excuse me, the broadcast wave format, uh, file format. Uh, he was confused and brought up the advantages of FLAC for preservation because of, it has embedded checksums that document the compression. It has uh, open source tools to verify the losses, compression, storage efficiency. And as I got into this conversation, I realized that I knew how to repeat an awareness of what the best practice was, but I was questioning like why I was defending it and not participating in the questioning, not like getting deeper into the conversation about like why we're, we're meeting the objectives that we have the way we're trying to do so. And I didn't really know how to engage uh, better at the time, but I re realized later that I was kind of playing the role of a naysayer um, or using best the name of best practice to discourage a evolving technical conversation. Deeper into my career, I found that Many conversations at conferences went along the theme of uh, saying uh, that our, our community has already decided that we will do things exactly this way. The, the impression that those who might propose an alternate uh, are disruptive or uninformed. For a community working towards consensus and consistency of practice, those who also work to question that or suggest something otherwise can be met with skepticism or discouragement. Uh, this panel will examine navigating that intersection between consensus and innovation, as well as navigating uh, innovative work against uh, any onslaught of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that come from the communities that we're trying to support. And with that, I'd like to introduce my uh, panelists who will briefly introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Morgan. Hi, my name is Morgan Morell. I'm the Director of Preservation at BAVAC, and I work uh, with a lot of physical and video media performing the, you know, hands-on transfers of the media, as well as a lot of work doing uh, scripting, automation, and working with open source tools sort of on the digital end of it. So, yeah, that's my approach. Bryce. Thanks, Morgan. My name is Bryce Rowe. I'm the Director of Audio Preservation at NEDCC in Andover, Massachusetts. Um, and I manage audio reformatting projects, <clears throat> excuse me, that use um, traditional playback methods for magnetic tape formats, um, but also um, an innovative optical scanning technology called Irene for reformatting historical grouped audio formats um, like wax cylinders, lacquer discs, etc. Hi, uh, my name is Genevieve Farmer King. I'm the manager of media preservation services at the New York Public Library. Uh, my team manages the outsourced digitization projects for our uh, research audiovisual collections, um, also the quality control of digital assets produced during digitization, and a lot of the documentation of specifications and workflows and physical conservation. So for those of us starting in a preservation job, the idea of community supported best practices offers us a foundation uh, from which to build upon. Uh, like Karen talked a bit about this with OAS and other kind of established best practices as like kind of a building block that we have common rules that we follow. Uh, could you talk about the role of best practices as far as they apply to your work? Uh, I'll start with uh, Bryce. Sure, so um, I think Irene provides kind of the best example in, in this conversation. Um, uh, with Irene, we're using 
um, the high resolution cameras to image grooved audio formats. And then we are using software that basically mimics the motion of a stylus through the grooves to create an audio file. So it's a completely different set of tools um, than what is outlined in um, like IASA's, uh, um, uh, why am I blinking on the document name? Uh, procedures for like creating and preserving digital audio objects. Um, and so that's kind of our main foundation of best practices, but it's um, almost too prescriptive <laughs> um, because it'll speak directly to like, um, you know, specifications for an analog to digital converter. And, you know, we have to sort of um, meet the same requirements, but using a completely different set of tools. Um, and so I think we use that as a basis and then um, anywhere that we deviate from best practice, um, we try to provide really clear justification and documentation um, of that, as well as education to the community that we serve is sort of why we're making this change, um, because it better meets the requirements of a preservation workflow, even though it isn't the exact standard. So, for example, um, the, the preservation standard for an audio master file is 96K 24-bit fixed point. Um, we deliver files um, from Irene at 32-bit floating point. It better preserves this dynamic range that you get when you're working with really damaged media that's recorded really low, but you have these huge noise spikes. Um, and so it just takes um, a really clear justification <laughs> of that decision, but also really careful examination of our workflows kind of all the time against um, documented best practices that kind of are insufficient for the new tools that we're using. Yeah, Morgan, can you add to that? As yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, we, you know, working with both the physical and digital portion of it, there's a lot of different uh, ways that best practices come up uh, in the digital space. You know, we're digitizing files and we want to make sure, like we use the concept of like broadcast range the pro concept of broadcast range gets set uh, talked about a lot when we're talking about setting levels and um it's just sort of uh it's it's interesting because that concept has sort of been borrowed from another industry rather than being really something that we as like archivists have come up with ourselves and so because of that there's a little bit of stuff that gets lost in translation as to like is it okay if something goes over broadcast range? Uh, like, what is it okay if certain types of content clip? Uh, and so this, I feel like this is just sort of like something that hasn't really been discussed because we've just sort of borrowed language from somewhere else, the, the concept of broadcast range. Uh, it happens in the physical space also as well in regards to baking. Um, I think that a lot of the practices, standards and best practices that, uh, are in regards to baking were made uh, and discussed years ago when the tape when the tapes that we're working with were at a different stage of deterioration. And then, like in as far as like the way that Bayback serves our community, uh, we do work with libraries and archives, but we also do work with a lot of individuals and artists and people without a lot of IT infrastructure. So the files that we deliver to them like there can sometimes be a disconnect between like what we want to deliver as you know like people like people who are working within an archives context and what people want to receive who are just like community members and don't like even know what a file is in any like meaningful sense so the, the, that's where those are the kind of three parts where we see a lot of tension uh and also are just kind of relying on best practices because of what we have to do so jen yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, for us, I think the adoption of like open source and lossless lossy compressed formats in general came from sort of an awareness of the significance of best practices, but also this need to like reframe them as starting points for specification choices. Um, so like in the case of DPX, I think a lot of people speak about DPX and J2K and other formats as uh, preservation standards, but without the like clarity for example, about variations in like RGB encodings that are supported by TPX and like that, as you just mentioned, are like, uh, I think that's due to DPX's usage in the production industry, like these variations, um, but there's no conversation about the limitations of these formats, um, such as like not supporting frame level checksums, these things that are important to us in this totally different context that's not related to like production, really. So I think in all of your answers, I hear a theme of like, um, like in some cases where best practices are taken almost like a, a, a binary, like somebody 
is like finding a, a, a PDF on a standards organization or a community organization as like the best practice. And in their conversation or collaboration of you, it's like, I want to figure out like, are you talking about something that like does pass this best practice or are you making exceptions to it? And um, like, as, as Bryce mentioned earlier, like sometimes like we do need to make exceptions to it and do need to kind of document why we're doing this. Um, so I wanted to ask you like, what, like when working on something new or innovating or making an exception uh, for a reason, like how do you go about like working against um, messages coming back to you about like people who are afraid of that or that they are kind of sharing uncertainty or doubt or they're being skeptical of, of your work because it's not like, yes, I can check off like what you're talking about matches the best practice. Not sure who to pick on first. Oh, <laughs> I can start. Um, nope. So I, I don't think that we got a lot of pushback, really. I mean, we did, but you know, there were certainly concerns. Um, but I think for us, it was helpful to sort of draw parallels between these concerns about our specification choices and the concerns that everyone has about comparable or like conflicting tools or workflows. Um, so like a lot of people have concerns about open source software, but as Joanna White mentioned earlier in her talk today, like all software have bugs. So it's just that like high production value companies are a little bit better at shielding clients from the development side of their work. So they're not really, people aren't exposed to bugs in, in uh, working with those like, you know, more mainstream enterprise products. So like, I think information, like providing information is helpful. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, Irene, like on the whole, as a technology has even gotten has has faced a lot of skepticism. It's so um, new and so different from from use of um, uh, you know a stylus traditional playback method. So there are a number of ways that people have been really um, skeptical of it. And I think I think the biggest challenge there is um, is an, like an argument around even one issue like the use of 32 bit floating point can be really difficult because um, I feel like there isn't even really like a shared, like we're not, we're not um, assessing or evaluating um, like the value of any um, new thing using the same like criteria <laughs> almost. Um, and, um, and so it's almost, I think we try to constantly think about like, um, our goal, like our goals as preservationists, like um, not how how easily does this um, just check the check those boxes um, that are outlined in in a um, in a standard. It's like, well, we sort of have to be a little bit more philosophical <laughs> about like how, how does this best meet the criteria of like a preservation workflow. Um, and then I think uh, what I the strategy I have found is just to be really comfortable with unknowns, comfortable with questions, comfortable with the fact that you're in uncharted territory. Um, and then even just being really honest about that, I think um, audiovisual preservation is a relatively new field. And so just even saying that to clients is like, yep, we're still, we're still learning. We're still mm. dancing. <laughs> um, like this is, you know, conservation, even um, ethics and practice were developed long before this. So you should, you should expect advancement, you should expect new things um, and sort of just being really honest about that. I don't know if I answered that question, but. <laughs> Good. Yeah, and like as far as being honest, I think um, it, it, it's like Bayback's position is sort of funny because like we are like a vendor, we provide a service, but we also have but doing do research and try to like, you know, be like thought leaders or try try to, you know, publish our work and be like really open about everything. And so as part of that, like when I started discovering like there's certain equipment that causes problems in the digital video signals. Uh, certain equipment that like it says it makes 8-bit, it says it does 8-bit or 10-bit transcoding, but it actually only does 8-bit uh, conversion. Um, this is the sort of stuff that like we couldn't see before QC tools. I, I, I realized that there were 10-bit video scopes that existed, like 10-bit digital video scopes that existed, but uh, they're extremely expensive. They weren't things that you would have in like a digitization lab unless you had a lot of funds. So the kind of advent of QC tools suddenly opened up all these doors. We're turning over all these rocks and suddenly seeing all these problems. So I kind of, my approach was like, okay, 
like here are the problems that we're having with the equipment that we use and trying to make it sort of like about a, like a discovery process, you know, because uh, it, I, I, you know, you just like, you don't want to step on somebody's toes and make it, make someone feel like you are dissing their work <laughs> or like their livelihood necessarily. So <clears throat> I've, I've definitely had an experience where uh, sometimes like I'll go to a professional community and I'll, I don't remember this is like DAT tape reservation. I'd, I'd be like, I'm, okay, I'm using a DDS drive and I'm having some trouble with this or this. And I would get like some responses from the community that would just be like, oh no, no, you're completely doing it wrong. Like you're, you're like, your question is invalid and just kind of shows that you are making, are making mistakes from the beginning. And this is how it's supposed to get done. Um, so, uh, I mean, that that's a more obvious uh, or extreme example, but do you have any advice for people who are trying to, distinguish between like what's healthy criticism and what is just kind of like active discouragement because I, I think like for new professionals like it takes a while to kind of gain that experience to tell the two apart um so like how, how would you advise like differentiating between healthy healthy criticism and skepticism uh you know for new professionals trying to work in innovative ways so I'll start with Morgan because I'm looking at you. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I had like that exact issue when I was talking about like the DPS 575 and I posted in the old VTRs forum like, hey, I've noticed a few things that uh, are we is weird about this. That the yes, video input doesn't work. Well, I was like, I won't get into the details there. And um, basically, I just got like dogpiled on a bunch of people like telling me that I was using it wrong. And I was like, look, I'm not using this thing wrong. Like I'm identifying it. I thought I thought people would be interested to know like that, like maybe the things that they were using, like had these sorts of uh, issues. It's like a well-loved tool in that community. And I know why, because I love the tool too, but uh, it has limitations. And so um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, with that approaching that community, I don't know what the answer is, but I think that other communities like EMEA um, can be more open. Uh, definitely, I think that uh, with like the kind of more professional archivist community, uh couching everything as like research and and uh and basically being very open with the documentation uh is really really helpful because i think that uh you, a lot of people just want to be able to kind of like see you know the the, the work being done and i i, I realize it, it is tough you know like you basically like if you're gonna go up against what people think is uh you know this sort of dogmatic standard like that that if the standard or the best practices are seen as dogmatic then you're going to get some pushback but if I, I think that like a lot of people i think it's also important to know that like the people who are most vocal sometimes on these listservs like aren't necessarily like representing the, the entire uh brain trust you know like it's so so it, it is helpful i feel like i've been like yelled at not yelled at but i've been told i was wrong places and then other people were like oh no i actually really appreciate that you said that so it is good to understand that yeah, I think we it's important that? to to oh sorry. Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, keep it going. Oh, to to have confidence, like like um, right. Morgan, you were just saying that like relying on your own expertise and relying on the larger community rather than just like sort of uh, focusing on like a couple people's comments. We have a bit of a dialogue in the chat around like how do you convince convince more a uh, conservative like archivists that maybe uh, that, that they shouldn't be as concerned or maybe they're really tied into like older practices. How do you like promote things for them so that um, uh, they know how to uh, 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 follow the maybe the newer trends that are more trustworthy? I think that Brianna's comment is pretty uh, uh, accurate that like I think a lot of older or not not older but like like more embedded institutions um one of their main concerns is like cost effectiveness and um a lot of things come down to like time and resources which translates to funding and if you can make a financial argument for your decisions which usually you can if, if there are real benefits those usually translate to financial benefits um i think that that's a good starting point Yeah, I think the, the, the last question I had prepared was, on one hand, um, best practices and consensus are like our, the foundation we need, but we also need to keep evolving, experimenting, innovative, which kind of means going going against them or going beyond them. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering, from your experience, like our consensus building and 
innovation competing interests in a way. Um, like I remember like early in the development of FFV1, it felt like there was kind of some competitive feelings with JPEG 2000 um, because like a big part of the community wanted there to be like a, a decision like that we had like one option um, as if that made everything easier. So trying to, to make more than one option like felt kind of disruptive in some ways. Uh, I can I can certainly relate to that, and it's um, kind of a big difference between, like, in my situation, advocating or or more educating, like, um, an archivist or a librarian who is considering like using Irene for a project, um, versus the larger community that might feel threatened by technology that is different from their you know normal practices. Um, but I think. Um, I think where consensus is really important is to is to have a similar set of goals, right? Like to a similar set of objectives for what our preservation work should accomplish, um, without there necessarily being one way of accomplishing that goal all the time. Um, and for Irene, that's certainly the case. Um, it can be just as simple as empowering someone to make an informed decision about um, about the care of their materials um, and not saying, not making it argumentative about like, this is the only way to do it. Um, but um, yeah, a shared set of, a shared set of goals in terms of, in terms of consensus, I think is probably most important um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just really, pres really prescriptive um, rules that we look at as, as like, yeah, I think it's important on one hand to like both contribute to and like be a voice in the development of best practices, but also kind of question them as they age. Like I remember when I started working as an archivist, it seemed like the the best practice for audio storage was gold CDs. And now that would seem kind of ridiculous to do at this point. Or I worked with one organization that was still recording all their audio on a quarter inch. Uh, because it was a decision made like decades before, even though like, you know, digital storage and like was well available at the time. Um, so I, f I found like kind of the older a best practice tends to be, the more kind of skeptical I have to be of it. So if I see like, you know, a PDF that's recommending like AVI on a 15 year old website, I'd be like, you know, the age of this best practice should be kind of considered as it too. Uh, like some gold CD lovers in the chat. Nice. Yeah, yeah I was going to say um, with the gold CDs, like they, like, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm one of the of you have experienced this, but like what was digit migrating a collection of like 2000 of them and like 600 of them had like been damaged beyond playability. Like the, the table of contents was damaged beyond the, the playability. But I, I do think that um, like uh, taking the approach of being like, oh, well, there's other best practice that you know about, well, that doesn't work. So maybe you should throw the rest of them Oh wait, I think that that is just going to be too oppositional for a lot of people. Um, if you can kind of like sneak that in, you know, it's good. But I think people are going to be more responsible to like buy in, you know, and like like being a voice for the community, like and and rather than being like oppositional, being like, well, this is like Bryce said, like we have shared goals and people will accept that you have shared goals if you can show some sort of buy-in with the community at large. So I think innovation is going to be best accepted if it's from people who are kind of within the established community, you know, not gatekeeping notwithstanding, like, you know, I think they are a fairly open community to people who, you know, show that they're interested in being a part of it. Yeah, I'm also realizing have, that, oh, oh, go ahead, Ashley. No, I was just gonna say we have uh, three minutes left, so wanted to get some people's final thoughts here, but Dave, uh, you can start. Uh, that's a good thing to do. <laughs> I can ask uh, for Jen Bryce Morgan, thanks so much, but do you have any final uh, thoughts to share as we close up the, the discussion? Not really, I mean, I guess the, the main thing that I would say, uh, that's like the common thread in all, all of our approaches to these, sounds like, like a, a um, encouragement of like critical inquiry and like, I think one of the ways that I I use to differentiate like naysaying from just like critical inquiry is is like how much people are engaging in a conversation rather than just trying to be like no. Hmm. Um, and so I think that that's like what this conference is really great at doing. It's just continuing conversations. 
Well said. <laughs> All right, Bryce Morgan, anything else to end on? Think Jen. Yeah, three whole minutes. Thank you all. Yeah. All right. Well. All right. Well. Thanks for um, coming to this roundtable, talking about innovation, consensus, skepticism. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Ashley to introduce the next panel. Um, but thanks to all my presenters and enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I'm back. Um, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Especially thanks to Morgan for coming in uh, quite early in the morning. Bing, bing, bing. See all of you later.